interesting to have you and I speaking because we are not on the same side of the political aisle. I mean, you are a person, your background, you were the spokesperson for the Bernie Sanders campaign. I, I mean, I was very much identified as a, tr a Trump supporter about as far as you, as you could be in the media's eyes uh, when he was running in 2016. And yet we do find ourselves allied in, in the belief that people in America should be able to criticize the actions of foreign governments without having their entire livelihoods risked. This is not normal. And yet there are so many people who know, like I know and like you know, that if you are in media, you got to be careful talking about Israel. Why is that? Yeah, it really is the one true red line. And I think you experience that as being part of a media organization that I think rightly really prioritized and focused on various threats to free speech in various different contexts and across the political spectrum. But it really does feel like um, free speech, when except for when it comes to Israel, progressive, except for when it comes to Palestine. I mean, there is this Palestine-sized whole or exception in a lot of people's principled stance against various issues. And, and I say progressive except for Palestine because there are similarly people on the left who say that they care about various groups, who say that they are anti-war, but who very similarly will look the other way or frankly become very oppositional when suddenly the people that we're talking about who are being see under siege in a conflict are in fact Palestinian. Yeah, and, it, and it's, it's particularly interesting to see the way the media reports on these incidents, and I, I see it already in how they're speaking about your firing, because they don't actually say what it is that you said that was controversial. I saw this when I the Daily Wire, Andrew Clavin does this episode, he kind of, he's like, she was saying things in a way, but he can't actually point to what I said, because actually there was something that I said that was controversial. Unless you view a certain race to be just above and above critique really is what it is if you, if you view a certain race to be above critique and i found that when i was being lied upon by a, a, a man named rabbi barclay i mean he he lied so badly about me that they pj media wound up taking the article down after i interviewed him because i was genuinely curious like how could you you say you're a rabbi you're supposed to be, you know supposed to be a leader in your community and you're you're publishing lies about things that i never said and when he when he spoke to me he was very honest and I realized, okay, he's actually just a racial supremacist. Mm -hmm. He's telling me that he believes that, you know, if Jewish blood is shed, it does in fact matter more. Um, when it is Jewish history, it matters more. And I, I appreciated his honesty and I could see why we were gonna be on the wrong side of this issue because I don't believe in racial supremacy, whether it's coming from BLM leaders talking about, you know, their list of demands for white people. I don't believe in white, racial supremacy if it's white people. And I certainly am not going to accept it uh, if it's Jewish people. I just, that's not something that anyone should accept. Well, it'll come as no surprise to you, Candace, that I, I feel differently about, um, when we can get more specific about uh, your qualms with BLM, but with respect to uh, Israel, I do think that what has become increasingly clear to people is that the ideology that sort of justifies um, in a Jewish state created in the middle of an Arab land really requires a commitment to uh, basically expelling, ethnically cleansing, and even committing what has been described by the ICJ as a plausible genocide against the population so that there can be a Jewish majority. And I know that's a sort of uncomfortable fact, but it's one that I think many people are coming to when you start to question why it is that Israel has made the choice to treat five million people who are in constructively occupied territory in both the West Bank and Gaza as second-class citizens for years and years, not to mention the 20% of Israel's population who are subject to about 60 different laws that discriminate against them in terms of housing, employment, and in other kinds of arenas. And it all comes down to when you start to listen to people explain why they think it's acceptable to, for example, kill over 270 Palestinians and murder so many children the way we saw just a few days ago uh, in, in, in Gaza to rescue three hostages, you have people very openly saying it's justified. It would have been justified to kill 500, 1,000 Palestinians if it meant um, getting three hostages back. And I certainly understand prioritizing hostage exchange. And this is what I told to the sister of the hostage that I spoke to on Rising last week. Certainly, if you want to prioritize hostage exchange, 
I agree with that. And we should be talking about the protests that are being put on by the families of hostage vic- uh, 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 families of hostages in Israel against Netanyahu because they rightly perceive him as being the primary obstacle to prioritizing hostage exchange over what he has said is his priority, which is eliminating Hamas. All that being said, there are ways to get the hostages back. It is evident and could have gotten them back months and months ago if that were in fact the priority. But instead, the cost, the value of Palestinian life is perceived as so cheap as compared to Israeli lives. But we've seen and said that they would rather do these um, uh, military organizations with the help of the U.S. government using a U.S. built pier that cost three hundred thousand dollars was told it was a humanitarian peer using an a, 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 a action that was in fact a war crime using a humanitarian vehicle to trojan horse uh, military officers into a refugee camp and then kill almost 300 palestinians in the effort to get three hostages back and also killing uh, 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 losing an Israeli soldier at the same time, does that really seem worth it? I think the average person says no. And I, the only reason you come to a yes is if you really very cheaply value lives that are, are not Israeli. And, and that's where I'm getting at, where I say it's, it actually is, what we're talking about now is just racial supremacy. You know, I don't know a single person who was not horrified by what happened on October 7th, who obviously wants every hostage to be returned we, because we value the lives of the innocent full stop. It doesn't yes. matter to me if that's an innocent Palestinian life or whether it's an innocent Israeli life. And, and as soon as I was e- saying this is equal to me, suddenly all of these attacks started.